The words echo out in different languages, but the faces are much the same. Anger, hatred, and violence flare up in the name of religion. We preach love and understanding. We all denounce bloodshed. No one wants it. Why then are so many believers caught up in it? Isn't religion supposed to bring reconciliation? Why has so much blood been shed in the name of the Prince of Peace, and in the name of Allah, and in the name of Jehovah? What's behind this unholy, never-ending conflict? It is written. This is George Vandeman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today from the Empires in Collision series, one word, two empires. this road in 1947, hundreds of thousands of Muslims fled north to their new homeland, Pakistan, leaving ancestral lands and homes, possessions, jobs, everything behind. And on the same road, they met countless other refugees fleeing south, Hindus leaving all they possessed for India. The partition of India into two nations, one Muslim, one Hindu, produced an upheaval of epic proportions and unleashed hatreds that had been simmering for centuries. I was here that eventful year and remember vividly the refugees on these roads fleeing for their lives. Muslim majorities in the north set upon their Hindu neighbors with startling vengeance, slaughtering men, women, and children. Hindus in the south attacked their Muslim minorities, their neighbors killing old and young with a band. Perhaps the most frightening bloodshed occurred along these tracks, where train loads of the uprooted were stopped and ambushed. There were days when not a single train got through without its burden of the dead and the wounded. Those who lived through this Holocaust would never forget the sight of trains arriving at Lahore or Amritsar with blood-spattered cars and railway platforms with a crimson evidence of slaughter. The carnage between Hindu and Muslim was so intense, widespread, so pitiless that many veteran soldiers said, it's far worse than anything we saw in World War II. How can human beings slaughter the helpless? How can people kill children in their mother's arms? Why does it seem the worst horrors are perpetrated in the name of religion? We wonder. Perhaps we Christians may feel a bit superior about the so-called heathen killing one another, but tragedies like this are not restricted to the exotic Orient. We in the West, we also have our horror stories, our long tradition of bloodshed in the name of God. It happened here in Paris in the middle of the night at 1.30 a.m. August 24, 1559. A bell began to ring in that church tower, the Tower of St. Germain, Lucivore. The tolling bell sent a signal throughout the city. Death to the Huguenots. France at the time was maneuvering for power between two enemy nations, Anglican England and Catholic Spain. The majority of Frenchmen were Catholics. And in the tense political situation, their fear and hatred of the Huguenots that was the Protestant minority in their midst, had intensified. Powerful Catholic nobles succeeded in persuading the French king to eliminate the troublesome minority. And tragically, many Frenchmen were willing to wield weapons against their neighbors of a different faith. So on that terrible night, as the bell tolled, Christian men rushed out into the streets with swords and clubs, Huguenot men and women and children were dragged from their homes and murdered. 
Over there, the killing started, right near the loom, where the leader of the Protestants was staying. Proceeded to the hill, then on to the university quarter. The streets ran red with blood. In the morning, the citizens of Paris were met with an incredible sight. The same river which cuts a lovely green swath through this city of eternal spring was simply littered with thousands of bodies. The Seine flowed red. It was St. Bartholomew's Day. On this holy day, honoring one of Christ's 12 disciples, men who professed to follow Christ, massacred others who also called on his name. And a slaughter, the slaughter spread to several other cities and provinces of France. Tens of thousands of Huguenots were butchered in cold blood because their faith was judged impure. What kind of madness drives people to do this? We wonder, it's hard to understand. Something terribly demonic happened here on St. Bartholomew's Day, and it strikes uncomfortably close to home. It wasn't Hindus and Muslims slaughtering each other in fall of India. It was Christians passionately wielding the sword against fellow Christians. Even more disturbing is the fact that the shouts of those who make enemies by their faith still ring out in our world, loud and commanding. Protestants and Catholics still battling it out in Northern Ireland. Christians against Muslims in Lebanon, Shiite Muslims persecuting Baha'is in Iran, and on and on. Killing for God? Why is the world convulsed with it? Well, I'd like to suggest what might seem to be a disturbing answer. There are many political and social factors involved, but I think we can get behind the scenes and see a larger picture, larger forces at work in our world. And to get this perspective, we must go back in time to the very first conflict. And would you believe it? It happened in heaven, of all places. Lucifer, a brilliant archangel, became proud. Caught up in his high position, he began grumbling about God getting all the glory. And the Bible gives us this glimpse here in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. So important. Look. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So instead of enjoying God's fellowship, Lucifer wanted to compete with him. He challenged God's right to rule. Lucifer, the archangel, turned into Satan, the accuser. And finally, he led a third of heaven's angels in open rebellion against God's government. The book of Revelation tells us, 12th chapter, verses 7 and 9, And there was war in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. War in heaven sounds almost impossible, doesn't it? But because God had created beings with free moral choice, the possibility existed that someone, sometime, would choose to oppose him. Satan was that first someone. Now God could have immediately vaporized this ungrateful traitor who spread lies about him, questioning his fairness and goodwill. But that would have left the universe with questions, mistrust, so God let Satan promote his alternative plan on planet Earth. He would have a chance to prove that God's laws were unnecessary and that people would be happy without God's fellowship. The universe would have a chance, you see, to see which way was really best. Well, as we all know, Adam and Eve listened to Satan's sales talk in the Garden of Eden. They fell for his insinuation that God was holding something back from them. They, they bought into his promise that they would be like gods and never die. And so Satan got a foothold, began to work out his alternative principles. He began to build his kingdom of darkness, his alternate empire. And during this series, my friend, you will discover just how vast and penetrating this evil empire has become. 
Now remember how his empire started, in a war against God. Satan had been at war ever since, and it is a religious war. Don't mistake it. Satan animates men's worst passions in battling against God's way. He's trying to set up an alternative religious system. We usually look for God's enemies amid some atheistic secular power. And it's true that Satan works through godless regimes. But remember, he's not just interested in opposing God. He wants to replace him. Satan seeks to counterfeit genuine faith in God and genuine religious experience. He wants to re-channel our zeal, not stuff it out. He seeks to capture those on fire for God with other blazing passions. Satan attacks God through religion. Remember that the next time you see some contorted face of some fanatic on the news shouting death to the infidel. The next time you see the faithful slaughtering each other, Satan is involved in a religious war. Don't forget it. His greatest triumphs come when he uses religious fervor to arouse the most intense hatreds and cruelest instincts. By the way, I am sure you'll want to ask for our telecast book at the close of today's program. It's Empires in Collision, Your Survival Guide Through It All. It contains all eight programs on the coming conflicts between the Kingdom of Christ and the Kingdom of Satan. Also additional material that will illuminate this vital truth. The book is free, yours for the asking. Now, God did not simply give up planet Earth to Satan's evil empire. He planted the seeds of his own righteous kingdom ages ago in the mind of Abraham. He nurtured into being a people who lifted up his true way in the midst of idolatry and corruption. Remember, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. For centuries the nation of Israel kept his law alive and continued the ceremonies that pointed toward a Savior. Humanity always had a choice, and God always had his witnesses to his truth. These prophetic witnesses climax in the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus swept through Galilee and Judea, healing the sick, casting out demons, and proclaiming that the kingdom of God had arrived in power on the earth. He was God's ultimate counterattack, the establishment of a rival empire based on the principles Christ embodied and taught. He was a charismatic leader who aroused intense religious fervor. It didn't call for the blood of infidels, Instead, he shed his own blood on behalf of his unbelieving enemies. Instead of fighting sin with a sword, he took upon himself its inevitable, inevitable penalty. Christ's empire was founded on the cross, on his life, sacrifice for our sins. And that empire were to spread throughout the world and challenge Satan's dominion. The way of love and reconciliation has had its victories Remarkable victories. Let me tell you about just one. It happened right here in India, the same land where religious strife had taken such a heavy toll. In 1867, a Norwegian missionary named Lars came to live among the two and a half million people called the Santel. They lived in a region to the north of Calcutta. Lars demonstrated great ability as a linguist. He soon became so fluent in Santal that people came from miles around just to hear this foreigner speak their language so well. And so he began to talk about Christ's great kingdom to these people. He exclaimed the good news of salvation. Now Lars, like many missionaries, wondered how many years it would take before these people, so far removed from Christian influence, would show an interest in the gospel. How long it would take for them to open their hearts to a very different good news. Well, to Lars' amazement, the Santel were immediately electrified by what he was saying. After a while, one of their leaders exclaimed, what this stranger is saying must mean that Thakur Jiu has not forgotten us after all this time. Lars caught his breath. He was astonished, because he knew that Thakur was the Santel word for genuine 
and G-U signified God, the genuine God. Lars realized he was not introducing some new concept by talking about the one supreme God. And so he asked, how did you know about Thakar Jiu? The Santel replied, our forefathers knew him long ago. Lars then asked, since you know about Thakar Jiu, why don't you worship him instead of the sun or worship demons? Well, the Santel faces around the missionary grew wistful. That is the bad news, they replied. And then a Santel sage stepped forward and said, let me tell you our story from the very beginning. Well, the sage proceeded to tell a history of how mankind had, a, had become alienated from the true God. And that, amazingly enough, paralleled the Bible story. In the present age, the sage said, it is said by some that the sun god is Thakur. But the forefathers taught us that Thakur is distinct. He's not to be seen with fleshly eyes, but he sees all. He's created all things. He set everything in its place and he nourishes all, great and small. While Lars listened with growing excitement, here a people had been prepared to receive the good news, just as the Jews were prepared by their sacrifices and ceremonies to receive Christ as the Messiah. The missionary discovered that generations of Santel children had growing up hearing their elders exclaim, oh, if only our forefathers hadn't made that grievous mistake we would still know Thakur Ju, the genuine God today. But as things stand, we've lost contact with him. Well, almost before Lars realized what was happening, he found himself with thousands of inquirers on his hands, begging to know how they could be reconciled to Thakur Ju through Jesus Christ. They were thrilled by the thought that their sins could be forgiven that the rift between themselves and the genuine God could be healed. And healed it was. Soon Lars was reporting back to Europe as many as 80 Santel baptisms a day. Converts began to reflect Christ's character, and they bravely took the gospel still further among their own people. The good news bore fruit. In Lars Santel mission alone, 85,000 believers were baptized and many other missions were created to evangelize and train those who'd been waiting so long for Thakur Jiu. Yes, Satan has spread his empire far and wide. He deceives and seduces and bullies people into his evil empire, but God is at work on our planet too. He's planted seeds in people's hearts all over the world that will wait to sprout and bloom. He seeks to win them to genuine faith through a loving witness. One world, two kingdoms. Two kingdoms competing for the allegiance of mankind. Oh, friends, they're about to collide as they never have before. A confrontation is coming which will overshadow all previous conflicts. The book of Revelation points to a very vivid picture of that struggle that will climax Earth's history. A life and death struggle over the hearts and minds of every inhabitant on this planet. Yes, battle lines are being drawn right now. The enemy is fine-tuning his greatest deceptions, his most seductive lies. It's not easy, not always easy, to tell the two clashing empires apart. Sometimes they seem to overlap. Tragically, some who profess to proclaim Christ's kingdom really advance the alternative evil empire. The church itself can become corrupted. Its voice can be distorted. Its hands can be bloodied. In the series of programs we're introducing today, you'll discover just how the empires will collide. You'll see where the battlefronts will be, and you'll understand the truths that will stand at the center of that conflict. Through God's Word, we can see the overall picture. We can gain a definite sense of where we're going and what we'll be facing in the near future. And that's what we want to share in this mini-series, Empires in Collision. Because when the two empires are seen clearly, their principles spotlighted, we'll be able to make the right choices. We'll be able to stand for the truths that are eternal. And we'll be able to find a hope in one kingdom that lasts forever.
Oh, listen, friend, now to the heralds as they sing a beautiful medley about the founder of that eternal kingdom, the name of Jesus. Thank you, heralds, for blessing his saving name. Shall we pray? Father mine, we thank you for establishing your kingdom of love and reconciliation on this earth. Teach us in the weeks ahead as we try to see clearly the principles that underlie your empire. 
help each of us to seek refuge in the Christ who dies for us, who lives for us. Help us to cling to him through the coming crisis. In the Savior's name we plead. Amen. This brand new book, Empires in Collision, goes right along with us as we travel and study together. The entire TV miniseries is included here in these thrilling pages. We've got a copy for you if you'll just take time to call or write, send us a note, and send it to the office or call the convenient number on your screen. I know you'll appreciate having a personal copy of Empires in Collision. Call or write us today. We'll put your copy in the mail immediately. Now here is the information you'll need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Today it was India, then Paris. And now, for just a moment, before we say goodbye, this mysterious, majestic city of Rome. Next week, we'll be right here for part two in our Empires and Collision series. The steep stairs to go. Those stairs are right here in Rome, and I hope you'll be with us for that intriguing telecast. In fact, for every program in this eight weeks miniseries. But now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <laughs>